So we'll be going over Form SSA-8, Application for Lump Sum Death Payment. This is the lump sum death payment that uh, survivors are paid by the Social Security Administration when a person under the Social Security system passes away. This is the payment of $255 that has not been adjusted for inflation in quite some time. Before we go through the form, it would be uh, beneficial to go th to the SSA 8 uh, page on the Social Security website so that we can review the uh, documents and the questions that the Social Security Administration will be asking you for when you make this application. So the Social Security Administration may ask you to provide any or all of these documents and that includes a birth certificate or some other proof of birth, proof of citizenship, or lawful alien status if you were not born in the United States, military discharge papers if you were in the military service before 1968, W-2 forms and or self-employment tax returns for the past year, and then a death certificate for the decedent. It's important to note that the Social Security Administration can accept photocopies of W-2 forms or self-employment tax returns. However, they must see the original documents for most other documents that you'll provide, such as the birth certificate, a passport, uh, things of that nature. Uh, if you give, if you send them to the Social Security Administration, they are responsible for returning these documents to you. If you go in person, uh, they may be able to make copies on site and give them back to you before you leave. Uh, here is a list of information that the SSA will ask for either on the form or in person if you go to the SSA office to make this application. Your name and social security number, the decedent's name, gender, date of birth, social security number, the decedent's date of death and place of death, whether or not the decedent ever filed for social security, Medicare, or supplemental security income, whether there was a disability injury illness or other condition during the previous 14 months that prevented the deceased worker from being able to work, whether or not they were ever active duty military, whether they were in the railroad industry for at least seven years, whether they earned social security credits under another country's social security system, names, dates of birth, and social security numbers for any former spouses dates of marriage, and how and when they ended. Any uh, information on any unmarried children under the age of 18, 18 and 19, and still in either elementary or secondary school, or disabled prior to age 22. The amount of the decedent's earnings in the year of death in the preceding year, uh, whether there is a parent who is dependent for support at the time of death, and whether uh, the decedent and the surviving spouse were living together. If you are the surviving spouse, then uh, there will be additional questions uh, that you will have to answer. And all of this information is on this form, and we'll go through this step by step. In item one, you will print the name of the deceased wage earner or the self-employed person. First name, middle initial, last name. You'll check X for either male or female and then in 1C you'll enter the social security number. In item 2 you will print your first name, middle initial, and last name. In item 3 enter the date of birth for the deceased, month, day, and year. In item 4 Enter the date of death, month, day, and year, followed by place of death in 4B, city and state. In item 5, 
Did the deceased ever file an application for Social Security benefits, disability, supplemental security income, or Medicare? If no, go on to item six. If yes, uh, answer B and C. So in B, you'll enter the name of any persons on whose records the other application was filed. First name, middle initial, last name, and then their social security number in 5C. If the deceased worked within the past two years, then answer item six. If not, move on to item seven. So in item six, about how much did the deceased earn from employment and self-employment during the year of death? And then in 6B, how much did they earn the year before death? In item 7, you will only answer this question if the deceased passed away before turning age 66 and within the past four months. So if this is applicable, then you'll check yes under 7A then you'll enter the date the deceased became unable to work, month, day, and year in 7b. If no, move on to item 8. Item 8 asks about uh, military service. So in 8a, you'll answer whether or not the deceased was in active military or naval service. This includes reserves and National Guard, active duty, or active duty for training after September 7th, 1939, but before 1968? If yes, then answer B and C. If no, then go on to item 9. In 8A or 8B, enter the dates of service, month and year, from month and year to month and year. Has anyone including the deceased, received or does anyone expect to receive a benefit from any other federal agency? Select yes or no. In item nine, did the deceased work in the railroad industry for at least seven years? Check yes if applicable, otherwise check no. In item 10, did the deceased ever engage in work that was covered under the social security system of a country other than the United States? If yes, then answer 10B and list the country or countries uh, that the deceased worked in. If no, go on to item 11. In item 11, you'll answer whether or not the deceased is survived by a spouse, yes or no. If yes, Enter the information about the marriage at the time of death below. If no, go on to 11B if the deceased had prior marriages or item 12 if the deceased had never married. So in item 11A, you will answer spouse's name to include a maiden name if applicable, when the marriage took place, month, day, and year, where the marriage took place, city and state, how the marriage ended, when the marriage ended, month, day, and year, and where uh, the marriage ended, city and state. And then whether the marriage was performed by a clergyman or public official or some other person, which you will annotate uh, who that person was in the remarks section. Spouse's date of birth, spouse's social security number. 11B is for any prior marriages that it lasted at least 10 years. So 10 years is an important note because a prior spouse may be able to claim Social Security benefits on an ex-spouse's earnings record. This, no, this has no impact on either uh, the ex-spouse or any new spouses. So if the surviving spouse is on a second marriage and the decedent's first wife tries to claim Social Security benefits, it does not affect the surviving spouse at all. You'll enter the exact same information, um, name, when and where the marriage took place, how it ended, when and where, who was performed by, 
date of birth and whether the dis spouse is deceased. And then the spouse's social security number if known. In 11C, uh, this applies if the decedent had surviving children uh, and the deceased was married to the child's mother or father, but that marriage ended in divorce. Uh, then you'll annotate the, the same information as you did in 11A and 11B. In item 12, you'll list the full name of each child that is surviving the decedent. This can be natural children, adopted children, stepchildren, dependent grandchildren to include step-grandchildren who are either age 18, age 18 to 19 and attending a school, age 18 or older with a disability that be began before age 22 uh, within the past 12 months. So if, if there is one or more of these uh, qualifying children, list the, the full name. If none, then write none. In item 13, you'll check whether or not there's a surviving parent or parents. If yes, then you'll enter the name and the address of the parents in the remarks. Uh, this would be a parent that was receiving support and at least 50% of their support was coming from the deceased at the time of death. Item 14, have you ever filed for Social Security benefits on the deceased's earnings record before? If yes, select yes. If no, select no. If there is a surviving spouse, continue with item 15. If there's no surviving spouse, uh, then you can skip all the way through to the end of this form. Uh, after line 18. So in line 15, uh, you'll enter a surviving spouse's name and address uh, if you are not the surviving spouse. In item 16, uh, this asks for circumstances around the decedent and the surviving spouse when, they, when the decedent passed away. Were they living together? If yes, move on to item 17, but if no, then uh, you'll have to answer the rest of the information. 16b, if the deceased or the surviving spouse was away from home, whether it was temporary or not, uh, then you will have to uh, complete who was away. Was it the decedent or was it the surviving spouse? The date that that person was last at home, the reason the absence began, why they were apart at the time of death, and then if they were separated because of illness, enter the nature of the illness or the disabling condition. Item 17, if you are the surviving spouse and you're under the age of 66, answer this question. If not, move down to item 18. 17a, are you so disabled that you cannot work or was there a period of time during the last 14 months when you could not work due to your disability? If yes, enter the date that you became disabled if no, then move to 18. So if you're the surviving spouse, uh, this question asks about any prior marriages that you might have had. So if yes, then enter information about your prior ma marriage if it lasted at least 10 years or ended due to the death of that spouse. And if you were divorced, then remarried to the same individual within the year immediately immediately following the year of divorce, and the combined marriage lasted at least 10 years, then you'll need to include the marriage. Uh, you can use the remarks section on the back page or attach a sec separate sheet, but you'll enter the information uh, of your prior marriage as a surviving spouse. Uh, right below this is the remarks section. It, if you need space, you can attach a separate sheet. And before signing, you should understand that you are declaring all of this to be uh, true and correct to the best of your knowledge under penalty of perjury. If this is correct, you'll sign in the signature field, date it, indicate a phone number where you may be contacted during the workday, starting with your area code, 
you'll complete your mailing address, uh, number or and street address, or P.O. Box, city and state, zip code, uh, name of your county, and then right below that you'll enter your direct deposit payment information, uh, your routing transit number, followed by your account number, indicate whether this was a checking or a savings account, and then whether or not you're going to enroll in Direct Express, which is the direct deposit system. You may sign with an X in your signature field, but only if you uh, have two, at least two witnesses that are willing to sign, uh, acknowledging that they know you personally, and as long as they write down their complete address. On the back of the form, uh, there are a couple of spaces. Uh, it's a telephone to call if you have a question. Uh, this is part of your receipt, so a telephone number, uh, the date that the claim re was received, and which SSA office. They should indicate how many days it will take before uh, you hear from them. Uh, you'll the, the claimant's information will go here, and then the Social Security number here. The rest of the page four contains the Privacy Act statement that indicates what the Social Security Administration can and cannot do with your information, as well as the Paperwork Reduction Act, which estimates you should take about 10 minutes to complete this form. That's it in a nutshell. SSA Form 8, Application for Lump Sum Death Payment. If you'd like, we've written step-by-step -step instructions in an article. Simply go to our website, teachmepersonalfinance.com, type in SSA 8 in the search bar, and the article should uh, pop up. Thank you very much.